Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Everybody and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I am your host, Lisa Woolfork, and as I always say for every episode, I am delighted to be speaking with the guest that we're talking with today. We are talking with Deborah Grayson, and I'm so glad to welcome Deborah to the program. I'm going to read, I, I know we don't do this, but I'm going to read a little bit of a bio about Deborah just so you can know why I am so excited to have her here today speaking with us. Uh, Deborah Grayson was born and raised in Washington, D.C. and Montgomery County, Maryland. She maintains an active art and studio practice in Northeast Washington, D.C. She holds a B.A. in English, Lang and Lit from the University of Maryland College Park, and an M.A. and Ph.D. In, from Michigan State University in American Studies. Now, American Studies is an interdisciplinary degree that allows Deborah to pursue her interests in science, technology, and material culture. Um, Deborah uses different types of media in her work to form magical and actual glimpses into the interior lives of Black women. These visual spaces show Black women as vulnerable, strong, fragile, bold, comfortable in our own skin, and free to express a full range of emotion. In her work, delicate and bold lines rendered in ink, graphite, oil, or gouache, are layered on canvas and wood to tell these stories. So you might uh, be, uh, you might understand a bit now why I am so so thrilled to have Deborah Grayson on the program today. Deborah, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. Kind of excited. <laughs> this is super excited because um, Deborah, you are just so amazing. You're so uh, just powerfully creative. You have such a beautiful vocal vision. And you render that in such ways that are so delicate and yet so strong. And so it's just really amazing to talk to someone also who has such a firm hold in the visual art world. Um, and so I'm really interested in um, how that might how that translates to your uh, sewing. Mm. So I think my first question is, what connections do you see between? Well, maybe the first question should be, how did your sewing journey begin? Um, how would you describe your sewing story? Um, I think, believe it or not, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a fashion designer. I love clothes. Both my parents and my grandparents were just very stylish people. And my father would always tell me stories about how when he would go out, he would always be dressed really well. And he pressed what was then called his dungarines oh, yes. <laughs> and so, or his slacks. And so I, I was just always interested in fabric and how it draped on the body and how it could serve as a form of creative expression. Uh, but in terms of sewing, I didn't really get interested in sewing, sewing until I was in graduate school. I was working uh, my dissertation and to kind of deal with the isolation of sitting in the library writing all day, I would... Um, go over to was the Looking Glass Quilt Shop in Ann Arbor. And uh, I started quilting and I started sewing some of my first cloth dolls at that point. So, and then from there, I kind of got into sewing tops and things like that. But it was just a nice kind of break from being in my head all the time. So it's so funny that you say that because my story is very similar that, you know, but I grew up with, you know, women who sewed and sewed and sewed and I didn't want anything to do with it. But when I was in graduate school, especially working on the dissertation, mm -hmm. I just felt like I wanted something that I could start and finish within like a reasonable period of time. Yes, because yes. writing that dissertation took me forever. <laughs> um, so 
that was so. So you're saying you started um, as with the was was the what was the first thing you remember making? Do you remember what the first thing you made was? Yeah, my crazy behind decided I was going to make a double wedding ring quilt. Oh my god! <laughs> as, as my first quilt, I did it too. I don't know how, but, you did but it. I did like, it. Oh, uh, that ain't no thing. What uh, yeah. a chicken wing. Let me get them rings on. <laughs> And then from there, I got really into applique, and um, I liked uh, the Baltimore wedding quilts, except I was more into what Harriet Powers was doing. And I have to say, one of my major professors when I was an undergrad at Maryland was Gladys Marie Fry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm very familiar with her work. I saw her give a lecture here. She's amazing. Oh, she was phenomenal, and she was quite the mentor and you know, I stayed connected with her all well until her passing, actually. Uh, and so knowing what Harriet Powers did with the quilt, I'm like, well, this is an interesting way to tell stories. And so that's that was a rabbit hole I went down. <laughs> and it was a good way to combine drawing and sewing. So that was another kind of outlet for me. Oh, that is excellent. So what we're talking about here, if you're not familiar, Harriet Powers is... Um, uh, an enslaved woman who is known for the Bible quilt. I think that quilt might even be on display at the museum, at the African American Museum in um, D.C., the Smithsonian. Is that true? Do you know if that's you know, there? I, I don't remember seeing it. It could be. the. I know that there was one in Boston, and I think yes. there was one in Georgia for a while. But you, you may be right. It's been a while since I've been um, at the museum. I can't remember. I think there's also one at uh, Clark Atlanta in the library, if I'm not mistaken. And, and what she's illustrating is this story, like one of the one of my favorite panels in that quilt is The Night the Stars Fell. Mm-hmm. And it's the story of, it must have been a meteor shower. Is that what we would call it? When, the, when like a bunch of stars like, or it looks like a bunch of stars are kind of falling. And I think that that, was, that incident was like a... Um, like a prophesy or a prophecy that some people saw that in prof- saw that in prophecy or mm-hmm. saw that as a sign of prophecy. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I don't know. I just really love how she did that, but I love this idea of thinking about applique as a form of drawing, mm-hmm. um, you know, because what you are doing is applying fabric to, um, a solid, um, quilt or a solid, um, field of fabric. Um, and these images are just so, well, at least hers are so powerful and yours are so powerful. That's amazing. So you made a, your first thing, was it like, you know, a tote bag? No. It was like a double, you're like, who needs, I got a bunch of tote bags. You know what I don't have? A double wedding ring quilt. Yeah, it was interesting because um, I had gone to another sh- a quilt shop. Uh, at that point, I guess I had moved I was in New York and then I moved to Atlanta and I would go to these stores and take classes and I would always upset the teachers. One, because I never used the dead colors that they always wanted me to use. These like browns and grays. I mean, just kind of really grayed down colors. Mine were always really bright. And uh, two, I never followed the pattern. And so they would always get upset with me. So, yeah. You are a re- you are rebellious uh, a rebellious quilt workshop student. Um, well, to me, it was just about expressing creativity. Who wants to make something someone already made? I mean, for me, that's what I was thinking. But I, I'm not knocking patterns. But I just wanted to do something different. So. It's, it is very interesting because I know there's some people who are of the opinion that you have to know the rules before you break them, and there's other people who say why would you begin with a position of confinement? Why not yeah. start from a position of openness and see where that takes you? Like, where do you, where, what do you think about this, that distinction? Do you think that's a, a, an accurate um, I, distinction between the two things? Like someone has to come in and follow all the rules and learn all the tools and learn all the this and that and do it that way. And then maybe as you get confident, you can do your own thing. I mean, I've heard that, and I know that that's a way of learning, and I know I like to study, I definitely like to study what's come before me, and then I like to throw it away and try to figure out how to, you know, reinterpret it or interpret it in ways that are interesting to me. So I feel like whatever gets you into it um, and feeds your soul, feeds your interests, um, do it. So I guess that's how I would answer that. I think that's a, I think that's a, I think it's a good answer, you know, because, for me, I have I definitely notice that for some folks who are quilters, like they want they want the exact 
it's like they want the exact thing that the pattern says. So that's why they have patterns and they have, um, sometimes they'll sell like um, jelly roll kits or fabric Mm -hmm. kits that go with the pattern. So that basically at the end of, like I say, for example, you're doing a block of the month club, that here's the block of the month club block. And here's all the fabric for the block of the month club block. And at the end of the year, you will end up with a quilt that looks exactly like the quilt on the pattern envelope that thousands of other people have also made. Um, yeah, and that that's, a, that's an appeal to me. Tell me more about your thoughts on that. Well, I was just going to say that took the most fun part out of the, the equation for me because the exciting part is selecting the fabric and selecting the colors and deciding how you want to put the thing you want to put together to express what it is you want to express. And so, again, I'm not knocking it. I know plenty of people like that style. It just, it didn't do much for me. I, it didn't interest me. So when I saw the kits, I was like, huh, why would I want to do this? So, I even if I bought the kit, say, I like the pattern, but I wouldn't use the fabric in the kit. I just wanted the pattern and I would go do what I wanted to do with it. I would give the fabric to somebody else. So... It's so funny because um, the story you're telling reminds me of um, when I spoke with Benita Hinton. Um, she is a she does machine embroidery and digitizing machine mm-hmm. embroidery designs, and she said almost the exact same thing. She went to the, she would go to these shops and learn how to do digitizing, and you know they were like, okay, now we're gonna make our you know our daisy chain of embroidery designs and she was like I don't want to make that (laughs) like okay now we're gonna make a little sailboat and she's like and I don't want to make that either (laughs) um I did not come to learn to make that I just I came to learn the techniques exactly Um, and so and how we can I think one of the things that I love about what you're saying is that I think that there's a strange balance between like creative expression and structure Mm -hmm. Right. That here's a pattern. Here's a a, a quilt block. Here's a tutorial or whatever. And there are folks who want it to look exactly the same way. And then there are people who are very comfortable or their first instinct is to improvise. Mm -hmm. Um, And it makes me wonder sometimes, like, why do we not have more improvisation in the sewing space? You know, I think that even now improvising has become. Um, I think rather co-opted. Mm, um, yeah. There's a there's yeah. a pattern company I won't say, but there's a pattern <laughs> company, a, a, a big four pattern company that has a whole line of patterns now called hacking. Um, that's saying, oh, here's the base garment, and now you can do this sleeve or that sleeve. And I'm like, but do we need to be told that? Or I mean, I don't know. I'm of I'm of two minds about it, you know. But you know me, I'll buy the patterns and put it in the pattern drawer and never look at it twice. <laughs> So, <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting to me because I think it's it it's kind of a way of thinking. I mean, I've taught quilting before. I used to teach a beginning quilt class for a while. And it was so interesting to me to see the reactions of some of the students when I would give, the, you know, some broad guidelines and suggest that they go off and, and do their thing. And it would create anxiety in some students. They really wanted me to take them step by step. Yes. And so I had to learn to teach both ways. I admit initially that would frustrate me. I'm like, I'm giving you the keys. Go, you know. Yes, here. But, like, like, I don't know how to drive. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I had to. It's interesting to me. Not, not everyone is wired that way. So, yeah. And I think it takes time to kind of grow into um, creativity, Mm -hmm. you know, that sometimes, you know, I think that when I was doing some early studying on this topic as well for some writing I was doing, I I did this survey of quilt books. Mm -hmm. um, And so many of them were like very aggressive about the quarter inch seam allowance, for example. Yes, yes. Like, and matching points. <laughs> and the matching points. And your quilt is basically wrong or broken yeah. if it doesn't have these things. You know, and I can I can I understand it. I know if you're doing a round robin and you know you need to have this quilt block measure this measurement and somebody has a drunk quarter inch seam allowance or a really generous one or a really skimpy one, that you know, I can see that that would be frustrating. But so that makes sense to me. But then part other parts of it are just like why are you so, it see, it felt punitive, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it felt like if you do this wrong or if you, if this is a scant off, then your whole quilt is trash, yeah. you know, 
Well, I mean, I know you've heard stories of the quilt police, and so I spent a good portion of my early quilting life blowing up stuff that the quilt police wanted me to do. But yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Kind of interesting. It's so, it's so funny about the things that they police and the things that they don't police. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, and I think that I think this is one of the things I love about um, the work that you do and your overall approach is because it's so deeply personal. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the quilt book says or the quilt pattern says or the quilt teacher even says. It's about the relationship between this individual quilter, this person who wants to sit down and create something beautiful Mm -hmm. and their vision and execution of that, you know? And so like, I don't know, I I I just feel like we have so many other aspects of our lives with, that are policed, especially with black people. Like I know, right? <laughs> actual police. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, I don't have any patience for, you know, um, somehow being, you know, so robustly and roundly critiqued for, you know, one thing or another in the, in the, in the quilting community, right? Like sometimes my quilts don't lay flat. I have a quilt on my wall right now that I actually love and I spent so much time making I made it um, a few years ago. I got it started at um, the 5440 retreat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are a group in... um, North Carolina? No, no, no. These folks are in Virginia. They're on the eastern, like in the Virginia Beach, um, the Virginia Beach Norfolk area. Okay. And it's an African-American quilt guild. They they celebrated their 25th anniversary, I believe, in 2018. Wow. Um, And that's when I went to their retreat. Um, I don't know why I thought they were in North Carolina, but yeah, I've heard of them. They're fabulous. Yeah, they do really great work. It was a fun time. It was Mm. a really fun time. I met some people there. I met a lot of people there because I didn't know anybody when I went. And it was just so amazing, Deborah, to be in this room of African-American women and just to see the difference for someone like me whose um, formative years in quilting were from a white Midwestern tradition because I Mm. went to school at the University of Wisconsin at Mm -hmm. Madison. Mm-hmm. And that's Big where time. I started sewing and quilting. And it was all white people. You know, mm-hmm. I was always the only black person. I was always the youngest. Um, mm-hmm. And to go to this place now where it was like all black women and the work they would put up and show, it was just like mind blowing. Um, yeah. And so I had that quilt up on my wall. Deborah, is there a binding on their quilt? On that quilt? <laughs> No, it is not because I hung that I hung that junk up there. I quilted it beautifully. I did a lot of fine line quilting and detail on it. I used variegated threads. Um, it's this beautiful applique of my family that I did as kind of a photo style that I'd learned. Um, and I hung that junk up there. No binding. <laughs> No, and who knows? It might even be ripply. Probably because all my quilts tend to be ripply. Mm, and I, mine too. I know there's a way that the um, that the quilt folks can teach us about to get our quilts to lie flat. But at the end of the day, I don't care that much. Right. Like I don't you know, I don't mind if my quilt is not um, jury selection perfect. Well, that's not why I did it. I mean, my great grandmother was a quilter and um, she had she made quilts for each of her children. And my great aunt gave them. I have two of them before she passed, and I call them my magic quilts. Those things are heavy, heavy, but they have fabrics. Uh, My mother told me from my grandmother and my mother and, you know, many of the women, uh, some of my uncles in the family. And so um, if I'm having a bad day or something, I'll wrap myself in that thing. I don't care how hot it is (laughs) because it just feels like a, a hug, just knowing that her hands touch that, you know, so, yeah. That is beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So can we can we spend some time talking about one of the phrases that you use and I've heard you use before and I think I used it when I read um, the early introductory remarks. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is the idea of studio practice. Mm. Um, and so I want to take a quick pause and I want to take a quick pause. But when we come back, we'll learn more about studio practice with Deborah Grayson after this break.
and the Stitch Please podcast is really growing. Um, I want to thank you for listening to the podcast and ask a favor. If you are listening to this podcast on a medium that allows you to rate it or review it, for example, Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please do so. If you're enjoying the podcast, if you could drop me a five-star rating, if you um, have something to say about the podcast um, and you wanted to include that, a couple sentences in the review box of Apple makes a really big difference in how the podcast is evaluated by Apple, how it becomes more visible. It really is a way to kind of lean into the algorithm that helps to rank podcasts. Um, So if you had time to do that, to drop a little line in the review feature of the podcast, that would be really appreciated and it would help us to grow even further and faster. We're back and I'm talking today with Deborah Grayson. And Deborah, I have to tell you, in my phone, I have you listed as Deborah Artist. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, oh, wait, I, want, I gotta send up or something. Let me look up, oh, wait, what's her real name again? What's her, what's her government name? Um, and, I, and, I, and I put you down as Deborah Artist because I just think it's, it's who you are. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so, um, can you talk a bit about the, the phrase studio practice? And I think whenever I hear you say that, for some reason, it makes me feel relaxed. It makes me feel like yoga for my creativity. I don't know. Tell me about studio practice. Sure. Uh, I guess for me, practice or a practice or having a practice means that you are focused or committed to doing something on a regular basis. And so, yes, um, you know, having a yoga practice could be an equivalent. Uh, for me, the studio practice... Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a wonderful studio in an old warehouse in Northeast DC and it's my magical place. I mean, I would leave my notebooks and briefcase in the car. I would change my clothes and my shoes. I put on my clogs and I slide the doors open and that's the place where I go to make things, uh, from sculpting to printing. Uh, I used to sew there, but I brought all my sewing stuff home. Um, but yeah. So it's where I regularly go to do my creative work. Can we? Yeah, I I love that, and I wanted to talk about the dolls and the soft sculptures, the dolls and the soft sculptures. And it seems like um, I'm looking at how you think about the difference between sewing, like on the sewing machine, like to make a garment, and mm-hmm. doll making um, mm-hmm. or soft sculptures. Do you see? It seems. I guess I was going to say something stupid. I was going to say oh, the dolls are like a three-dimensional object, but then so are clothes. So I can't even make that kind of connection. But it just feels like the dolls and the soft sculptures are, they seem more, I don't know, I just, I don't know if they're as different as I'm at. They they seem very different to me. Mm -hmm. Like I've made a couple of dolls before, but these were, you know, dolls for my nieces and they were, you know, cut on this line, sew on this line, stuff it with the stuffing. I mean, and even then, I thought I was doing something. Um, <laughs> you were, you were. Yeah, I, I was completely following the pattern to the absolute letter, um, mm-hmm. so I could get this absolute thing to give to this little girl. Um, but tell me about your process in creating dolls and soft sculptures. And is are those terms different? Like, is a doll does a doll mean one thing, and a soft sculpture something else to you? Yeah, I love those questions. So I think for me, doll making or sculpture um, comes from a different place. I mean, I'm sewing those like I sew garments, but I'm usually sewing my own patterns. And usually I will draw it on the paper, you know, cut it out, stitch it, stuff it, and just keep fiddling with it until I get the shape that I want. Um, I think that... uh, I forgot. I lost the train of thought related to your question. What was the other part of the question? It was about the the, the connection between um, a doll and a soft sculpture. Like, do you see these as two different things? Thank you. Yeah. So I do see them as as somewhat separate. I I admit that at times I resist the word doll because in U.S. culture, it's often thought of as a toy or a play thing. And it's, it's considered a lesser art object, if you will. 
Whereas in other cultures around the world, you know, dolls are, are part of a spiritual practice or they're amulets or, you know, they're used to represent ancestors who passed on. And so all of those, I'm thinking about all of those things when I make work. I did start out making dolls. I made them for my goddaughters. And it was funny. What I found was that grown women wanted the dolls. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I stopped. And there's a whole different approach when you're making a doll for a child versus an adult. And I found that I much more enjoy making dolls for adults because of the nostalgia, because a lot of women of a certain generation didn't have brown dolls. I was fortunate enough to have them, but a lot of women had not seen them or never had them. And there's a huge audience out there of collectors. And so for a long time, for probably about 15 years, I made um, cloth dolls. They were completely cloth, painted faces, fiber hair, you know, um, and I had a whole line of collectors for those. And they were called urban wildflower dolls. And so I did that for a while. And then um, I got more into the sculptural part, which... uh, includes more mixed media. So then I started working with ceramic clay. I started incorporating beads and metal and wood. Um, And someone said, you know, if you really want to continue to sell these in the market based on the hierarchy that happens in the arts, uh, you probably want to call your work sculpture. Because if you call your work dolls, that galleries and museums will get kind of scared away. Uh, So I don't know. I kind of played that game, but not really. (laughs) So I'm fine with calling them either thing. But I just, I admit, sometimes I cringe a little bit when I hear doll just because I know that people think doll, they think cute, they think toy. And that's not what I'm doing. So. No, I love that. Thank you so much for that distinction. Sure. Um, and I really love the way that you connected it back to the to practices around the world where these same things might be amulets. It might be something you put on um, a shrine that you have in your home mm-hmm. um, to, to pay tribute to ancestors. You know what I mean? Like there's so many uses beyond um, the way that we might think of these things mm-hmm. and the idea of having to, well, not having to, but the idea of using a different vocabulary to kind of elevate the seriousness. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting to me um, about the feminization and how that becomes an issue, right? That if it's, you know, if it's a doll, then it's something that maybe girls will like or Mm -hmm. women will like or children will like. And as a result, it, it it loses its value. Right. Um, And I, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's it. Uh, I was going to say, and uh, I mean, I, I love what you just said there, and it's it kind of played into um, some a series of figures I've been making probably for the last five to seven years. Um, before I uh, left Atlanta to move back to D.C., a friend of mine had invited me to her home to, you know, sell my dolls, and I had I said, well, I need to have some things at different price points. So I started making these little figures. I call them power totems. And they're these little, I call them little magical, powerful figures. And I was shocked at the response to these uh, figures. But it's all about, uh, I don't know, having a vehicle or an altar or a place to um, house, exhibit, share, experience power. So I started putting them inside these little boxes and you can actually build altars around them. I, uh, I see these now in, um, is this what you have in your mixed media section? The mixed you. media sculpture be with magic, myth, and memory. That's it. And um, you have one called Sankofa. There's yep. one called uh, Diana, Camilla. How did you come up with these names? Uh, women who inspire me. Women that I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at these right now, and they are absolutely stunning. They are absolutely stunning. I wanted to talk a bit about, um, to get your thoughts on the distinction between art and craft. Um, I go round and round on this. You know, I'm, I'm not an artist, though I, I study popular culture and those types of things, you know, in my academic life. Mm-hmm. But I really have not found a good answer to this question about the distinction between art and craft. Because there isn't um, one. <laughs> well, say more, please. Well, excuse me. I think, again, it's so interesting. Uh, and I, I think this is, I could be wrong, but I find it very much so in Western culture and particularly in U.S. culture, these hierarchies that need to be created. And they often are connected to 
gender and race and um, uh, economic status. I really don't make a distinction. I think, um, you know, I, I consider myself an artist and maker of things. And so I love constructing things um, with my hands. And I think that the soft sculpture I make is a type of art. And I think my oil paintings are a type of art. And I just... I resist those kinds of hierarchies. I just, I don't find them interesting. And to your point, um, most people can't really explain the difference. Uh, but again, but still there are all these rules that have popped up around the industry about what you can show, what you can't show, uh, where you show, what people will think if you show in um, like an art fair versus a gallery. And that's why I'm kind of glad I decided not to go to art school because I, uh, I think I might have been more affected by some of that stuff if I had, if I had, so. Yeah, I, I hear that. I really do hear that. And I don't know why. I mean, I wonder, too, even in me asking the question, in what ways is that reinforcing this need for the hierarchy? I just feel like I've been going back and forth around this, the idea of, you know, art versus folk art. You know, all mm-hmm. of this, as you said, is, I think you're absolutely right, that these distinctions are based on, I don't know who is demanding them. Is it capitalism that's demanding them? Is it, you know, you know, art and fine art and folk art and heritage art, like all of these different words to describe what is essentially the same thing. Right. Um, and I'm not sure if I said, if it's capitalism, it's the, if it's idea of like market development. Um, I don't know, but it just feels like something, it feels like an artificial overlay over something that is so, powerful and so essential and necessary Mm -hmm. you know I don't know I I, I just I I, I do wonder about that I wonder about that a lot and that's an idea that I hold in my head a lot there was another one too that another kind of distinction self-taught versus trained that's my favorite one (laughs) so you're so you're self-taught if you don't have an MFA and I said to one person well I have a PhD so that trumps that (laughs) I mean, and it, it, versus the shade of it all. Yeah, though, right? it's very shady. And I think it's all of the elements that you describe, but I have not heard one um, succinct, clear explanation. And the only thing I can draw uh, from all of that is that it's there are these hierarchies are created for exclusivity and to make some people's work more valuable than others. And so that is if you have women, women artists, and that's why, you know, quilts are considered folk art or um, craft and sculpture is fine art. And But it's funny because even women who are fine artists kind of run into some of that same stuff. And then you layer all these other identities on it. It's the same thing. So I, I just don't subscribe to it. I, I, don't, I don't want to do it. And that's not to say that not subscribing to it doesn't cost you things because it does. But uh, I think it's just better not to try to uphold those old structures and to do something different. Because it, at the, I think you're right. At the end of the day, who is being served by this? Mm-hmm. Who is somehow saying, oh, you know what? My life is so much better now that I have a clear understanding of <laughs> who I can put on one side of the line and who I can put on the other side of the line. But there are you people know? who are heavily invested in it. Uh, yeah, it's real interesting. So. Hmm. Let's talk about what you have going on now. But can we talk really quickly about the Everyday Goddesses series? Because, oh, sure. Oh, my gosh. Those are amazing. And I was very proud of myself for identifying um, Martina in the light as um, a picture of you. So um, <laughs> I think we could talk about how astute I am. You know, I always love hearing that. Um, <laughs> But this is these are this is under the drawing category of your website. And um, are these prints like what's the process um, that I'm looking at um, in the Martina in the light image there? It's uh, mixed media. Um, So what I was doing was doing mono prints where I would use a surface glass plastic or you'll see those jelly print um, blocks. And I'd lay things on top of whatever the substrate was, a rollout ink and then rub the paper on there and I would get these different um, backgrounds and I would just keep layering color, layering texture, layering objects. And so I would just do that all day in the studio. I would have sheets of paper all over the floor 
And then from there, I would pick the ones that were really interesting to me, size them down to the size. And um, the everyday goddesses, uh, they're all, I think, nine by 12. And then from there, I would draw on top of them with ink and, or, and or gouache, which is a, an opaque type of watercolor paint. And so the everyday goddesses are women that I would meet, you know, I run into in the coffee shop or um, sitting on a bench or right? because it's interesting. I don't know what it is. I will sit down and inevitably someone will come and sit and start to talk and they would tell me their stories. <laughs> I don't know. This always happens to me standing in the motor vehicle department, sitting, I was literally sitting in a park one day and somebody just sat down. And so I'd end up listening and I would say, you know, do you mind if I take a few pictures? I'm an artist and I would show them, you know, some of the work I'd done. And then I would take pictures and I would use the photos as references. And so these are everyday women. And there's an additional layer to it because um, with all of the gentrification and in some ways really killing the soul of the city of D.C. as I had grown up in it and come to love it. Um, I, I've just been noticing uh, landmarks in the city uh, African Americans really being erased, or what used to stand there, there is now just a plaque. Um, they did the same thing with Chinatown. You know, it, the stadium is there now, or the uh, Phillips Arena is there now. So it's just, it's my way of kind of retaining the story by drawing uh, uh, photos or drawing from photos of women, everyday women in the city. And I was doing a contemporary version, <clears throat> pardon me, and then. I had uh, been given this collection of photos of black families from the 1920s through the 1970s. And so there's an image, I think, uh, uh, of a woman standing. I can't remember what category it's in. Um, But this was a woman from the 1940s in D.C., and I was able to draw her entire family from the 40s all the way up to the 70s. And uh, one of her children saw the photo, or I think must have been grandchildren or great grandchildren. Anyway, they bought <laughs> one of the one of the images from the series. So that's what that is. It's just everyday women that I think you know. I want to tell their stories, retain their stories. I love this, and there's so much about it to love that's getting me excited. One, it's like it reminds me of when you started doing the mixed media series, and you were thinking about these as as totems or as ways to, you know, to honor the ancestors. You could use the frame boxes that you created as a centerpiece or part of an altar. Mm-hmm. And all, it also kind of makes me think that people, that, that certain spirits, and I don't mean spirits in like sense of malevolence, but this, this energy mm-hmm. of black life and black love that is continuing to have it, kind of to come to you, right? Yes, yes. So someone just comes to you and it's like, you know, let me just tell her. I don't know, it's almost like you're like, a griot, kind of, right? Yeah. Like, you know, griots are African storytellers. Um, I know you know this. I'm just saying this for general. <laughs> um, griots are African storytellers who hold um, cultural, deep cultural memory. Yeah. And so they're, um, they, they tend to be older people, and then they train younger people in the telling of these same stories so that the stories don't get lost. Hmm. Um, and that's what I think Everyday Goddesses is, is, is doing. You know, I think as we move through and different communities around the country move through gentrification Mm -hmm. um, efforts where black people end up being replaced by Black Lives Matter signs in the lawns of white people. (laughs) Right. Yes. Um, You know, no, it's true. No, I know. That's why I mean, it's it's an uncomfortable laugh. But, yeah, I know it's true. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like and so to kind of have these images, it's just it's so powerful. Um, I want to talk a bit about color. Mm -hmm. Um, I was struck by something you said earlier about going to your earliest um, quilt classes and they would want you to play with these dead colors, Mm -hmm. right? Flat things. Mm -hmm. Um, And you, um, your your, your training, your eye, your interests um, uh, are brighter, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little about, can we talk about the idea of color um, as um, color, the way you use it in painting, color as in your, how you choose fabrics um, and maybe Can we think about color as a, I mean, how about this? Do you think about color as a language or a vocabulary? Ooh, 
beautiful. That was good, right? Yes, Sometimes that's very that English, good. That Thank English you. PhD, that Thank shit you, comes Dom. in handy, right? <laughs> You're working it out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wear it out, wear it out. Yeah, so I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, but you tell me, so how I come at color, color is very intuitive. It's also spiritual to me. Um and without sounding too woo-woo, people show up to me as color. And I don't mean, you know, skin color. I mean, when I see people, I see colors around them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I know some people are going to think, what is wrong with this woman? <laughs> but- hey, give me all the woo-woo. You, we have a very <laughs> wide and diverse audience for the okay. Stitch Please podcast. And some people are very woo-woo. So let's not even call it woo-woo because I can be seen as offensive to some people. Okay, good. Let's just call it a very broad platform of understanding that I includes the seen and the unseen world. How oh, about I that? I love that. I mean, that's funny because my dissertation was called The Hyper-Invisible Woman. But, um, Perfect. I, uh, I I don't often talk about it a lot because I know that not everybody under, has a broad perspective, I'll put it that way. But I do tend to see um, extra layers of color around things that already have color. And so I, my, to my eye, what's pleasing are bright colors paired with things that are seemingly discordant that wouldn't necessarily go together in most people's palettes. I like really bright paired with uh, grayed down neutrals. Uh, but I like clear, crisp, bright color that's not grayed down that I like to work with, um, for lack of a better word, a pure uh, pigment um, for when I'm designing things. And I think people don't always understand that when you, even when you're using primaries, it's the type of primary color, red, yellow, blue, that you're using that will impact what you ultimately get in the color. So if you start with mud, you're going to get more mud. Um, and so, and we'll talk about this later, I'm teaching a dye class to kind of teach people how to work with those kinds of colors to get bright colors. And, you know, I'm not the kind of person who uses the color right out of the tube or right out of the dye jar, uh, I think you can, you don't get a level of complexity uh, when you, when you use color in that way. And so I love to layer color, especially in dyeing because it's transparent. You dye something one color and then you over dye it or dye it again. And you can really, you know, impact that color. The bottom color still shows through, but depending on what you layer on top of it, um, you can tilt it in a totally different direction. And a similar thing, you know, with oil paints or watercolor or even fabric, there's a way to play with fabric that will uh, trick your eye into seeing different types of transparency, depending on what you uh, put a color next to. So, I mean, I haven't had any formal training in it, uh, but I know what I like and I know what I see. And I put those things together and they seem to work. So. And you have done some study of this, right? That you, you might not have, like you said, that formal training, but you are you also have an extensive training in your own record keeping. Yeah. Um, so let's transition to talk about the dye class that's coming up, y'all. This is just going to be happening in a couple of weeks. So you have time to go to um, Deborah Grayson's website and click on it, and you are going to see something amazing. <laughs> And these are going to be her Colorful Findings classes. So let's start with, this is a great opportunity to talk about how you got bit by the bra making bug. <laughs> um, can, can we can we talk about that, please? Yes, um, yes. I, I, I really wanted to talk about the squirrel in your pants um, <laughs> because um, I don't know if we're going to have time for that. But now that I feel like I put the squirrel in your pants out there, people are going to want to know um, what that's about. Oh, my goodness. Um, so yeah. so this, the squirrel in your pants is... Uh, <laughs> The squirrel in your pants is a uh, a, a lovely story about uh, Deborah sewing a pair of pants <laughs> that were that had what we could call unexpected results. Uh, you want to tell us about the squirrel in the pants, and then because I, yeah. I, I wanted to transition to talk a bit about sewing. Sure. So I'm fairly tall, and I have a 33, almost 34 inch inseam in my pants, and so I was learning to tailor pants to my body. Um, and let's just say my first attempt didn't work out that well. And um, from my waist to my crotch, I had this kind of weird kind of 
squirrely bulge is the only way I could describe it. It looked like, you know, the fabric was so ripply, like a squirrel could be running around in there. So for some reason that tickled the black women's stitch folks when I said that, but that's what it looked like to me. So that's Y'all, that when Deborah from. said it looked like she had a squirrel <laughs> in her pants, I think I nearly lost my shit. I was just, I just had this image of like a squirrel, like running around one of the base of her legs. And, um, it was hilarious. And they were so baggy, they probably could have. I think of like the Cinderella. I think, oh, those were mice though, where they ran around her. No mice, yes, yeah. that, that's right. They, 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 they did the sewing and all this, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but so, but let's, but I want to talk about you and the, and the bra sewing because yeah. um, this is something that we've been doing um, I think actually Black Women Stitch, like a lot of us started sewing, well, one of us, Dewan uh, Coburn, mm-hmm. she's been sewing bras for decades. Um, so that's no big thing for her. But like, I think a lot of us got the bug um, at the most recent um, 2020 Beach Week uh, retreat, which uh, was like our out. last big, um, our last in-person event. And, um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, there you are. Let's try okay. again. Yeah. That, that um, we we got the bra, the bra sewing bug kind of took off in March of 2020. Um, I made one. Um, I one I made one that I liked. I had made some before that I didn't love, but this one I actually really liked. Um, and then Nikki was there, and she you know um, has really taken off with the bra making. And now there's going to be a bra making. Um, there's more there's bra making classes with Nikki Dewan and Naomi um, doing bra making um, during the month of August and something big coming up in October. Mm -hmm. So you were a bit reluctant, I thought, about bra sewing in the beginning, I think. So can you talk a bit about how you switched over? Like what what switched for you? Because you went from being what I thought was a little skeptical about bra making. No, it was more than skeptical. I had zero interest in it. <laughs> Let's just be real. I was like, I have no desire to do that. Why would I do that? And then I kept watching, and it was just so funny because I kept seeing people putting their breasts on the glass. <laughs> like, Put your titties on the glass. So and it just on the glass <laughs> after they made their bras. And then I thought, huh. And part of why I wasn't that interested, I have to say, some of it was color because I wasn't seeing colors that I wanted. And then I was under the mistaken impression that it was just more complicated, all those little pieces than I thought. Uh, But then Duan uh, was going to do a sew along for all of us. And I had been collecting patterns. I said, well, maybe one day. And I thought, well, okay, I'll join the sew along. And then that happened at the same time that Nikki, Duan, and Naomi started the class. And so I sat in. And then I really got into it because I love construction. I love figuring out how things go together. And after I made that first bra, I think I had lost my mind. And I've made a bra a week ever since then. <laughs> I know. And they are all and they are all gorgeous. And Thank I mean, you. y'all, you should check out Deborah Grayson's um, Instagram page. And you'll see these bras in the in the and, and I, I would like to say. Each the each one is prettier than the last, but it's hard to even rank them because they are all so stunning. And one of the mm-hmm. things that makes them so distinct is the color, the the intensity of the colors, the way she's able to put together something like the way that the channeling of a bra looks versus you know the the, the front band or the cups or whatever. I mean, it they really are absolutely lovely and just fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, so they're really beautiful. So tell us about what we can learn in these. So, so now you are going to be having some classes mm-hmm. that are coming up soon. Can you tell us about those? Sure. Well, thanks uh, to the inspiration and encouragement from all the Black Women Stitch Charter members uh, and the fact that they have harassed me to no end. You're like, Teach a, bra, no. I teach a dye class, Deborah. You should teach a dye class. Uh, yeah, no just, end at all. I'm surprised you're not getting text messages in the middle of the night just being like, <laughs> how's that dye class going? Actually, I do. So. <laughs> but I decided to go ahead and um, do a class. And so there, are, it's, it's a, a suite of classes. There are three. The first one is an introduction, and that's the longest one. And it, it teaches how to use acid dyes. And the acid just refers to the use of vinegar or citric acid to work along with the, the dye to make the dye bind to the fabric. Um, so I'll be teaching um, how to dye a color wheel, how to do um, 
immersion dyeing for nylon fabrics. It would work as, as for silk as well, but I'm only focusing on nylon. I'm, I'm designing these classes specific to sewists and bra makers in particular who want to figure out how to dye their own findings because a lot of the colors out there, especially for a power net, um, there are just not a lot of colors. So for myself, I just would buy the white fabric in, depending on whatever pop of color I wanted to use in my bra, I would go dye it. And then people were like, where'd you get that? And I said, well, I dyed it. Uh, and so I'll show pe- people how to mix their own dyes and um, get them going um, for t- with 12 wonderful colors. From there, the second class um, teaches how to dye uh, value gradation. So uh, you start with a dark color, work all the way to the lightest light. And I think I'm going to do just 10 steps of color from dark to light in the class. And so, again, if you know how to take a color and dye up and down the value um, of that color, you know, you have a lot of choices uh, to play with for your findings, for your bras. And then the last class is how to dye between two colors. So say I take a yellow and a purple and I add a little bit of that color until I get to the middle and I have a 50-50 of each. Um, again, you have a whole range of colors. So with those three classes, I think you can dye all kinds of colors and just keep playing. And the thing that I'm telling people is you can do all of this with just three colors. You don't have to buy every dye in the dye shop. Uh, I have six colors that I typically use to dye all of the things that people see that I'm dyeing. Uh, I have two sets of primaries that I use. So in the class, you'll learn about those primaries, how to put them together, and how to play with them to come up with hundreds of different uh, sets of colors. So I'm I'm excited. It launches on uh, August 28th, and I just have the descriptions now, but probably when this airs, you'll be able to, the the registration will be live, and, and you can sign up. The first class, I think, will only have about 25 slots. So, And I see that you have all these wonderful supporting materials that you're using for the class, that people who participate um, as students get to get, like, they get downloadable handouts, they get um, some consulting time with you. At least I see that on the second um, for the for course two. And you're saying that course one is a prerequisite, right? You can't just jump to course two or course three. You should start with course one in order to cover the basics. Is that right? Um, in terms of the course progression, you want people to start at course one. Is that correct? Correct. Um, so, yeah, so tell us a bit about like what it means to build the courses the way you've described them. So I'll take a stab at that. And if I didn't answer your question, ask me again and I'll, I'll try it again. Um, so the first course is really the overview, all of the materials, the properties of the dyes, how to use them and how to do just a basic immersion dye where you take one color completely Uh, immerse your fibers or your fabric into the pot and then take them out. That class also covers mixing dyes to get certain colors. And we're going to do an activity where we dye color wheel and we'll mix colors. So by the time you finish that first class, you will have learned how to dye 12 different colors using three dyes to do that, if that makes sense. So there's the dye and then there's the dye solutions that we mix from the dye which will allow you to create all of those colors. So the introduction is really the full overview of the process, how to use the dyes, what tools you need to do, uh, what we're going to do in the immersion dyeing. And then the other two classes are for those who want to learn more how to dye, pardon me, values, and then how to mix between colors, uh, like the next level so that when you're done, you'll be able to dye hundreds of colors and you'll have a sense of what to put together to get you to the color that you want to do or want to make. That is amazing. I'm excited because I'm going to sign up, (laughs) as I have mentioned to you several times. Yes. Um, So I am really excited. And I'm also, I I also, I feel like hearing more about it makes me feel like, okay, like I can totally do this. So like if someone who is like me Mm -hmm. or me, um, does not has has like no experience in dying anything. Mm-hmm. Um, the only things I've ever died have been have been like horrible accidents, like putting a red sock in the washing machine with my white <laughs> towels by accident, um, and then I use that red stuff to kind of get the over dye out of it. Mm-hmm. But then your towels still end up looking weird and always slightly pink to you. Right. Um, so 
I've only had like, I think negative experience, negative accidental experiences with dying anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but you're saying that with the right tools and the right training that you're going to give us Mm -hmm. that we'll be able to do something, you know, really beautiful out of just three things. You can get 12 colors out of three. Oh, you can get more than 12 colors out of three. I'm just teaching you 12, but yes. Yes, and we will not be using RIT dyes. <laughs> Let me make that very clear. RIT dyes are a type of acid dye, but there's a lot of other stuff in it. Um, but no, we will not be using these. The dyes we're using are color fast, and meaning you know they won't run, and um, they're actually much cheaper than RIT dyes, and you can create um, many more colors and combinations with just the three dyes. So yeah. Well, and and you, you don't need prior experience. I've made it as simple as possible. Great. That's what I need to hear. <laughs> I've made it. You, no prior experience necessary are like my favorite words. Right. Um, so it, to give us some confidence going into the process. Well, Deborah, this has been absolutely amazing. I am so glad that you were able to come on today. And I'm encouraging folks to check out Deborah's website and these workshops um, because you get to see me because I'm <laughs> going to be there. Um <laughs> Can you tell us where we can find you on the, do you have, tell us any other than the dye workshops you have coming up? Are there any other projects you're excited about or things you're working on or sewing right now? Yeah. So I'm sewing lots of clothes, uh, mostly to look good from the waist up for all the zoom meetings that I need to do. Yes. Um, and also I'm launching, um, a, a, a store. So for those folks who just have no interest in dying, but who really, are interested in um, purchasing bold colors or an expanded flesh tone uh, palette for their bras and bra findings, I will have a store popping up called Colorful Findings, same name as the class. And so I'll have all of that um, launching from my site uh, shortly. So for now, if you go to my website, you can um, click to sign up for the mailing list. But probably, as I said, by the time this airs, uh, the registration links will be available on my website. And also you can click right through Instagram um, to get to it. And on Instagram, my artwork is at Grayson Studios, and that's mostly prints and paintings. And then um, my textiles stuff is at Grayson Studios Textiles, only because to me it just seemed weird to have paintings and bras in the same place. <laughs> so I, I separated them, but that's the only reason. So. You want to yes. see some of the bras that Lisa was talking about. I post uh, pictures of them. I'm posting they them are. on the internet. It's, <laughs> it's all art. It's yes. what it me. I you know, so Yes. I get because and those those bras are art. Oh my okay. gosh. They are stunning. They are stunning. Well, Deborah, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and thank you for sharing your gifts, the stories of your gifts, as well as the way that your artwork is really speaking to the past, present, and future. Um, I'm just so grateful to be in community with you and, um, thank you for all that you do. I was just about to say, to say the same thing to you. Thank you for all that you do. This platform, Black Women Stitch, just bringing, um, Black women, creators, makers together in this space. This is phenomenal. So thank you. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out with, to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transfer scripts and other things to strengthen the podcast and finally if financial support is not something you can do right now you can really really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them so i know that not all podcast um, directories or services allow for reviews but for those who do for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the stitch please podcast that is incredibly helpful thank you so much come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together Thank you.